everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Welcome to today's session on data empowerment and protection architecture. Yes, that's still the name of the session, although the slide on your screen might be confusing you. What you see on the slide is the response from to the optional question that I shared as part of the registration form. So special love to those of you who took the time to pen that down. The question was, what is a recent read, either a book or an article or a poem that you enjoyed? And why don't you share a beautiful poem by um, David White and while well, others share names of books that you've read. And I thought it'd be a nice way to kind of start this session by sharing this with you. On that note, I would like to introduce, first of all, welcome Siddharth Shetty, our speaker for today. Sid is a fellow at iSpirit Foundation where he works on India Stack. Um, as part of India Stack, his primary focus is on empowering Indians with control of their financial, health, telecom, skills, and education data through, the, through DEPA. He's also working on the technology for public credit registry, digital sky, and national health stack. Thank you for joining us today, Sid. Over the next hour, Sid will walk us through the what, why, and how of DEPA. He will cover the core principles at a manifestation of it from the financial sector as well as probably also from livelihood, um, depending on time, and also address some of the concerns around DEPA. We will try and do two breaks for Q&A, break for two interactions for Q&A. And while Sid is presenting, feel free to share your questions using the Q&A feature. Um, and during the Q&A, feel free to unmute yourselves and voice your questions. And I like I repeat this every time. Uh, sounds of kids, pets, loud spouses, vehicle, uh, vessels, vehicles are all okay. Um, so on that note, over to you, Sid. I'll stop sharing and uh, I'll let you share. How do I start? If there is. Yeah, over to you, Sid. Thanks. Thank you so much. Awesome. I'll just share my screen. Perfect. Are, are you able to see my screen? Yes, we can hear your screen. You might have to be a little bit more louder. Okay. Um, is this clear enough? Yes, this is good. Okay, perfect. So, hey everyone, I am Siddharth. Um, uh, I volunteer with uh, the iSpirit Foundation. We are a nonprofit uh, technology think tank and uh, based in Bangalore, but, but I've been locked down in Goa for the past few months. And iSpirit really, uh, our focus has been, we take a long term view of problems. And so the two societal problems that we picked up are financial inclusion. And our deep belief is that hard problems in India will be solved by a jugalbandi of public infrastructure and private innovation that gets built, diverse private innovation that gets built on top of these rails. And so our attempt over the past uh, seven to 10 years has been laying out the plumbing, the digital public infrastructure for financial inclusion in India. And that's what's commonly known as the health stack. And uh, we've recently started working on uh, efforts in the health space. Uh, and that's what's called the national health stack, part of which has been adopted uh, by the National Digital Health Mission that went live on 15th August. Now we take a 30 year view of these problems in other uh, uh, you know, developed economies like the United States, typically you'd have think tanks or you know, universities like MIT, Stanford or industrial labs, you know, MSR, Bell Labs earlier, that would anchor the long-term view, right? And then you would have say policymakers and VCs that take a a more eight to 10 year view and then you know startups and incumbents uh, startups which may either be challengers or incumbents in the space are taking which are really the most important taking the three to five year view and bringing this to life right and so our focus while i will talk through examples beyond financial inclusion of of DEPA, our real focus has been working for rajni right so rajni as you see out here is um, uh, she she takes you know she, she's a vegetable vendor taking a loan in the morning, retiring in the evening, right? Or the street side vendor for that matter, right? Most often, if you go to any of these informal markets, uh, say pre-COVID, what would happen is you'd have a truck income with the vegetables in the morning to the side of the truck you'll have, to the side of the truck you'll have informal uh, money lenders standing there with cash in their hands, right? And actually would go to them, take it often at interest rates of one, two, in some cases in South India, 4% per day, which when you idealize is exorbitant, right? And then repay it at the end of the day. And so the question for us really was, 
how do we allow for different formal institutions uh, to deliver credit to Rajni, right? And that means reducing the transaction cost for Rajni to be a part, to discover, be discovered, to engage with the system, and then also be empowered with control over her data so that she can access, you know, the best loan offers and, and then avail of the same. We first started off with, uh, of course, what a lot of you may be familiar with, uh, uh, which was part of Aadhaar, which was the whole electronic KYC that allowed for Rajni to not only in a digital manner prove her identity, uh, but electronically share her KYC information in a safe, secure manner uh, to open a bank account. And of course, these are open APIs. So the same was used to open a mutual fund account and get a SIM card like what Geo had done uh, and various other use cases. But that was step one, right? And if you go back in time, uh, which was roughly in 2008, less than 17% of Indians had a bank account, right? And if, there's a really fascinating report published by the Bank of International Settlements. I'll, I'll send a link to Sahana after this call and you guys should check it out, which talks about how because of digital public infrastructure like Aadhaar, uh, India accelerated financial inclusion by 37, 38 years, right? So traditionally, if you extrapolated the bank account opening rate in 2008, it would have taken us... 46 years to get where we did in 10, right? And uh, that's really the base step so that now she has a bank account. The next step is she needs a way to transact and those transactions be reflected as part of her bank account history, right? And if you go back in time, four years uh, from where we currently are, uh, the dominant payment mode was cards, cash or cards, right? And cards are very expensive. I mean, 1% is a transaction cost on each leg. Right. And so we went back to Visa MasterCard saying, hey, could this be reduced? Because, you know, if Rajni had to transact, she had to buy a POS machine, which, is, which itself is expensive. Uh, but not just that, every transaction, 2% is going to be cut off because of the cumulative amount in each leg. So essentially money, instead of going to the informal money lender, is now being sent to, you know, Visa MasterCard. And of course, the interest rates just don't work out. And of course, they said, no, that's not possible. We can give you maybe a discount, 0.5 on each leg. So it said, screw you guys. And that's essentially how uh, resulted in the creation of a mass market payment system, which is now called uh, UPI, right? So yesterday, what India did on UPI is greater than American Express's transactions worldwide. And essentially, it allows Rajni to, using her smartphone, uh, discover her bank account, link it seamlessly, and then receive money from her customers and repay her lender. And this allows for Rajni to build up using these small sachetized transactions, a digital transaction pay. Now that she's built up that digital transaction pay, the next question comes about how does she actually share this information with a lender, right? She's not going to, you know, leave her job, stand in line at a bank branch with that passbook, trying to get the passbook printed, right? That's very inefficient and, and costly for Rajni. At the same time, you know, some of the other dominant modes of data sharing, most of which are broken, is, you know, you digitally run around to different portals trying to download a PDF, right? Or you physically run around to different branches trying to take printouts, create a folder, upload that scan folder, uh, or upload digital versions of it uh, back to, let's say, a lender, or if you're trying to manage your finances, then a PFM app, and, and, and so on. Right? So hugely inefficient. In some cases, people even give out their username and password so that third party entities can screen scrape their data. All right? And that's where we believe that, you know, we had to move towards a system where Rajni has agency over her information and she's empowered with the ability to, in a safe and secure manner, share this with any other service provider she so desires. So think of it just like EKYC allowed for Rajni it was a very primitive system because it only allowed for sharing of KYC information in a consented manner. We've essentially come up with a generalized architecture for her to share her financial information, her health information, her telecom information, her education and skilling information in a safe, secure manner with informed consent uh, with any other service provider in the ecosystem. The next step is, of, of course, once Rajni uh, 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 shares her information. She needed a way to receive loan offers so that she has choice. Multiple lenders are available to serve her and give her the best, compete with each other and give her the best interest rates. 
right? And that's where the open credit enablement network comes in. You may have read about it in the news recently that Nandan announced about a month back, right? And uh, uh, once she receives multiple loan offers, uh, she needs a way to approve a loan offer, digitally approve it because if I to physically send someone, again, the costs don't work out, right? And uh, 1,500 rupees at least, and that's going to make the loan ticket size at least three lakhs and, you know, she doesn't need a three lakh loan, she needs a thousand rupee loan for that day, right? So that's why eSign was created, which was a way for her to do digital signatures on a smartphone. And then she needed a way, of course, to securely store her documents and that resulted in the creation of the Now, all of this has been built by volunteers on a pro bono basis, right? So within iSpirit, uh, 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 one of our ethos is no greed, no glory. So we leave the greed in us because, you know, we want them to take this public infrastructure and make it successful and uh, uh, no glory because we want to leave the glory to the policy makers, right? Uh, much like as what's happened in the case of Ada, UPI and some of this other public infrastructure that's been laid out. Now diving deeper into the uh, consented data sharing layer, it's really uh, uh, the third layer of India stack. Right. So if for those that are familiar with India stack, you will know about the identity layer, you will know about the payments layer, and you always, you know, the abstract heard about the consent layer or the data layer, but I'd really in through the course of this presentation, bring to life how that's getting manifested in a, a range of these sec regulated sectors to start off with. And the reason India is now at the inflection point is if you look at other economies, right, let's take the United States, for example, when their individuals became data rich, uh, the paradigm was very different, right? So in America, uh, uh, when the individual became data rich, fundamentally, if I was a developer, I would use that to create an app, capture data about the user, use the data to personalize any goods or service uh, 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 through an ad offering, right? And then on a commission on any uh, 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 good or service that was purchased by that consumer. And that's a hugely powerful and profitable business model, right? Some of the largest companies by market cap and revenue are fundamentally ad driven companies. But what's interesting is the same set of folks, while they have some of their largest user bases in India, draw relatively piddly amounts of revenue. And that's because at scale, most Indians don't have money to spend. And therefore, we felt could we invert this entire paradigm where data, instead of being used to sell things to the user, is actually used to empower them to access better financial services by you know, eliminating the trust gaps, bridging the asymmetry gaps that exist in the market, access better health services, right? Whether it's remote care or tomorrow AI assisted care, uh, access better you know, uh, uh, upskilling opportunities. You know, one of the biggest issues with blue collar workers as they uh, migrate from one location to another is portability of their credentialing information. Right? And that can only happen if individuals and small businesses have control over their data. Right? And once they have control, control gets manifested through the ability to consent and then safely and securely share this data with any other service provider in the ecosystem. Dive into the specifics, right? just so that we're aligned on a vocabulary. You can think of data as roughly uh, three categories. So you have personal data on one end, right? Just think of it as any information that's linked to an individual's identity, and therefore you need consent to share this information uh, uh, with any other party in the ecosystem. Anonymize that information. Then that anonymized information is what gets classified as non-personal data, so it's not linked to an individual's identity, right? And that's essentially what uh, uh, Chris, for those that are interested on the policy front, uh, this is what the Chris Gopalakrishnan committee that was set up by the Ministry of IT had been tasked to look at. They have now put out a report on non-personal data to lay out a legal and a technology framework with which non-personal data can be accessed. While personal data, the overarching policy framework is of course post the Supreme Court's right to privacy judgment in 2017. Uh, they asked the government to put together a committee to draft India's privacy bill. Uh, that's what came to be known as the Justice Sri Krishna Committee, who have now tabled 
uh, uh, the privacy bill in, in the Lok Sabha and it's currently under the select committee review, right? But, uh, 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 and, and while that bill essentially addresses, you know, uh, categories of data, uh, categories of personal data in unregulated sectors as well, uh, the rollout of the data empowerment and protection architecture, which is the technological underpinnings to the privacy bill, have started off in the regulated sectors because you already have a safe enabling place uh, with adequate protections and liability all built in uh, with which the rollout can happen. A subset, you can think of a subset of anonymous data or non-personal non data, which is essentially the high level statistical information, aggregate information uh, uh, being classified as open data. And this was part of you know, the Ministry of IT's national data sharing and accessibility policy. And uh, open data is essentially used, if you look at it from a use case standpoint, open data is essentially used for, you know, either driving better evidence-based policy decisions in, in recent times, say the COVID count in a region, right? Or you may use it to understand economic activity in a region, right? Uh, 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 you may use it to understand various other, you know, performance metrics and so on. But these are very high level aggregates uh, that are published. So if you go to data.gov.in, that is a class of open data sets that are published by different agencies, uh, primarily from the standpoint of transparency, bringing about more transparency within the system. From a use case standpoint, non-personal data, you know, one of the use cases you can think about is uh, anonymized health records, right? So in, uh, again, if you, if you look at COVID, it's proven to us that uh, diagnosis is fundamentally shifting. Clinical diagnosis is fundamentally shifting from uh, symptom-based diagnosis to biomarker-driven diagnosis, right? So no longer do you, you know, in the old way, show up at your doctor, doctor asks you a bunch of questions, checks your systems, uh, symptoms, and then uh, diagnoses your condition. You know, in COVID, 70 to 80 percent of folks were asymptomatic, right? And uh, therefore, you could not diagnose them in the back of symptoms, fever, cough, cold, a cough, and so on, right? And therefore, you had to do biomarker-based uh, testing, and that took the form of RT-PCR tests to know if you're infectious, or antibody tests to know whether, uh, you know, you have already gained the infection and, and no longer the infection present, so you develop antibodies. So these are all biomarker-driven tests. And so what we are seeing is a shift towards where as biomarkers get democratized in this country, uh, diagnosis on top will shift towards, uh, you know, uh, uh, a bunch of AI models reading off these metrics, these measurements from the body and making predictions on what the likely diagnosis would be and also what the likely care treatment protocol should be. You know, right combination of drugs, depending on, you know, maybe an individual may have certain mental health conditions and therefore you need a different care protocol than for individuals that don't have that and so on and so forth, uh, which today, you know, is, is not prevalent at all. Everyone just gets the same dosage, same care protocol. You know, in most cases, you may not even truly have that disease because the, the diagnosis is, is based on efficient mechanisms. And so from that standpoint, for Indian companies to build these high quality machine learning models, they do need access to anonymized information, anonymized data sets so that they can train these models. And if India wants to be competitive, there needs, a way, there needs to be a way for our startups to access these, again, in a safe, in a manner, that, in a safe manner, secure manner, in a way that you know, meets and complies with the, the law of the land. And, and that's really the intent of the non-personal data committees. So to put in place a legal and technology framework for establishing access to anonymized information. First, it will start off with health information, but you can imagine this for, you know, tomorrow building out machine learning models, either to track, uh, you know, delayed payments, right? Delayed payments are endemic in this country. And maybe what if you come up with a buyer score? So every time someone makes a delayed payment, their rank goes down. And just like you have a credit bureau score, if you have a buyer payment score, then it shifts the power asymmetry, you know, from buyers to suppliers. And a supplier can transact with you know highly rated buyers and hence receive their payments on time. Uh, you could imagine the same model being extended to, to, the, to the world of skilling and various other use cases going forward. But today I'll essentially talk about uh, how access to personal data, which requires consent, uh, will be operationalized. 
Now you could think of it, right? In, uh, I'll actually stop here and see if there are uh, any questions um, um, so far. Uh, let me open. Yeah. So there are two questions to that. Do you want to take that in the chat? Yeah. The Q and A is not opening for me, Sahana. Maybe because oh, I'm okay. present. Uh, no worries. I'll read that out to you. So we have one question. Would, could you describe what informed consent looks like for Rajni? How is it done? Sure. So I'll show you. I'll I'll, I'll pull a walk, I'll show you a demo of how an informed consent would look like for an India One user, and I'll also pull up a demo of how informed consent would look like for uh, someone that's from India Two and India Three uh, uh, in in the latter part of my presentation. Yeah. Great. Okay, thanks for that. Uh, so to paraphrase, Shanti says to paraphrase, non-personal data is just the removal of name, number, and any information that links it back to the actual user, or is there more? Yeah, so they could, they would be more as well, right? So it is possible, let's say, uh, if I take an example, um, so let's say I know in a particular region, in a geographical area, uh, there is only one person that has a health condition. Right, this particular ABC health condition. Right now, even if I strip away his name and his number and his date of birth, right, the very fact that that gets revealed to me when collaborated with other third party data sets, like this knowledge that I know only one individual has this health condition, will allow me to re identify. Right, and there have been a number of re identification attacks that have taken place where. You know, organizations have combined anonymized data sets with other third party available data sets. In some cases, you know, uh, 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 there, there was a case in Singapore, uh, uh, Prime Minister's health records being, you know, re identified and so on. And therefore, we have to tread very carefully. Uh, there are various techniques that are available where this can be done you know, not being publicly exposed as data sets out to the world, but through a virtual data room. And in a virtual data room, a lot more nuanced filtering can be applied. Uh, and there are techniques of differential privacy and others that exist that allow you to go beyond not just stripping away directly identifiable information like his name, date of birth, gender, zip code, but also other information that could tomorrow be used to pinpoint back to that individual. And, you know, there are techniques where if, there's only one individual that has that condition, then they will add noise before revealing it so you can't re-identify and so on. So it goes beyond that. Uh, 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 and it's not just basic uh, uh, stripping away of identity details. Yeah. Great. We have one more from Hita. Could you describe how revocable consent works for Rajni? Perfect. So I'll, I'll run through that in the tech, tech piece of this. Uh, so if you think of uh, the data empowerment and protection architecture, you can think of it uh, at three levels. Uh, one is the underlying technology itself. Uh, you know, if I want to give consent, consent's very abstract, right? And uh, what does it mean? When I want to consent a particular type of data for a particular time, purpose, and so on. Right. In some cases, consent may be revocable. In some cases, it may not be revocable. Right. So therefore, it's critical that this consent itself gets codified. Right. And so in 2016, the Ministry of IT published a national standard uh, for electronic consent that would be adopted by every single uh, entity uh, in the Indian system. The second step is where does a user go to generate this consent? Right? So this is great, you know, it's, it's standardized, it's available in a structured XML JSON form. But as a user, you know, where do I go? And, you know, Rajni may want a very different experience. She may need to be assisted as she authorizes consent. You know, I may not want an assisted experience. You know, my, my app may work, I'd like a self-service experience, right? And so given how diverse India is, right, a billion people, the number of languages that we have, you can't have one place where all Indians will go to manage their consent. And at the same time, therefore, you needed a market ecosystem of entities that come up that allow users to manage their consent, right? They compete on offering these different experiences. You know, then one may serve in their one, one may serve in their two, one may serve in their three. And that's essentially the creation of a new fiduciary entity 
into the system known as consent managers. And these are uh, uh, consent managers are, uh, and then the third is essentially their overarching legal framework and that's where the data protection bill comes in. And if you give the data protection bill a read, what you'll notice is there are two parts that are important. One is the bill reaffirms that every data flow has to be consented to, right? And has to be consented to, to in an informed manner. And they've laid a set of principles around what constitutes informed consent, right? The second is they've also enshrined for every data principle, a right to data portability. So they have said, you have a right to port your data from one service provider to any other in a machine readable structured manner using a consent manager. Now, while of course, like I said earlier, while the bill gets passed, the rollout is happening in a safe manner within the regulated sectors of uh, health, uh, uh, telecom, finance, and consumer education as well. So to walk you through the tech element of this, right? Uh, essentially what you're seeing on the left is a standardized consent artifact. So the way to think of this system is for those that are familiar with UPI, right? In the old world of payments, you went to your bank, which was the custodian of your money. You know, you would log in through net banking and then say, you know, debit my account and credit this end destination. And that's a hugely crappy experience, right? Most people, you know, Rajneesh, for example, will not know their username and password, right? In fact, if you go, uh, probably where most of you are located and ask 100 people around you, do you know net banking? Do you avail of net banking? Most people will say no. Right. And therefore, in, but there are legitimate reasons for money to be residing within your bank account, you know, reasons of monetary policy, reasons of consumer protection, uh, 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 various stability reasons. Right. And therefore, India made a very conscious decision saying that while money will remain with your bank account, the permission got unbundled from your bank into third party innovators, which are the phone pay, WhatsApp pay, Google pay, Beam. Paytm apps today. So these apps are purely permission collectors. They don't sit on your money. They're not part of the money flow. All they do is create a user experience and collect your permission, right? So you discover your bank account, you link it, you get a UPI ID. Uh, you can use that, share it with your friend. They can raise a collect request. When you authorize the collect request, money is debited from your bank account in your real time credited back to your friend or if it's a merchant then to the merchant's destination right and that's a hugely you know as has played out over the past few years that architecture is essentially what's now been generalized for data sharing as well and this is different from other parts of the world you know if you look at china's approach to building uh, 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 new financial infrastructure essentially they have taken an approach of wall gardens, right? So they've essentially got two wallets that are built on top of banks, right? Uh, heavily state driven. And then those wallet companies control all financial product innovation on top of it. And America on the other hand, are essentially saying, you know, let's disrupt all the incumbents, throw away the banks and central banks and go completely the blockchain route uh, because that's the only way, uh, you know, true innovation for the consumer will take place. So India's kind of taken this three layered approach of, you know, interoperable public good at the base, banks in the middle, and these permission collectors as innovators on top. Now imagine that same design being generalized for data sharing as well, right? So your data is remaining at source with your custodians, right? Which might be a bank, a mutual fund, the GST system, your hospital, so on. Right? And now you're going to these third party innovators, which are consent managers that will innovate on accessibility, that will innovate on creating better self-service modes, creating better informed consent experiences. Uh, and essentially these are the entities that are creating the front end UX that generates the artifact that you see to the left of your screen. Now the artifact is based on a set of principles that we call organs, right? So O, is it's an open standard published in 2016 by MITE, adopted by, uh, 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 by the various regulators as well as these have been adopted by uh, the uh, data protection bill. R in organs is it's revocable. So I could give consent to let's say 
uh, an entity to access my data, for example, a lender to access my data every week for the purpose of monitoring, uh, or I may give it uh, every day to a personal finance management app for the purpose of you know visualizing my finances and managing my expenditure a lot better, or I may give it you know uh, at a particular frequency to my doctor. Imagine I'm a diabetes patient, uh, and therefore you know diabetes or any one of these non-communicable diseases, most of which require continuous monitoring, right? So I can authorize consent so that they can monitor me and then follow up uh, as and when necessary. But once I give consent. Uh, on a periodic basis, I can also go back to my consent manager and revoke it. And when I revoke it, the data sharing stops. G in organs is it's very granular. So I can actually choose what parts of data I want to share and with whom. So I can say, hey, instead of sharing my entire raw bank account statement with the lender, if all the lender wants to know is have I maintained a minimum average balance greater than 15,000 rupees over the last three months, then I can share a granular query as a response to that. So the lender will only get a yes, no answer rather than seeing my entire transaction statement that says where all I ate, my entertainment options, where all I stayed and, and so on. And you know, you can imagine the same extended to either your educational information. Imagine I have an educational mark sheet. If all an entity wants to know is, am I a 10th grade pass, right? Rather than sharing all my 10th grade mark sheet certificates, I can just share a query that reveals that I'm a simple yes, no to that, answer, that, to that question. Or in health for that matter, right? Instead of sharing all my diagnostic tests, I may choose to share only a particular value or attribute as part of that diagnostic test. The A in organs is it's auditable. So every time consent is created, data is shared, a structured audit logs are generated. N is noticed. So just like when money leaves your account, you get notified. In the new paradigm, when data shared about you, you get notified as well. And S is it secure. So the end-to-end -end data flow is encrypted. So essentially what's happening is this consent artifact on the left, which is in some sense a standardized description of consent, uh, is then being generated by a new class of entities called consent managers that are truly the ones that a user, you know, they're batting for the user, they're working for the user, and they're the ones that users interact with. So the first consent manager, and if I divide, uh, um, uh, you know, within the regulated space, if I divide data um, uh, into a couple of categories, one is you'd have government data. And so the consent manager for government data is DigiLocker. You then have financial data. And so the consent manager for financial data is the account aggregator. You know, these are all the same entities, the same flows. The only difference is they have a slightly different name because you know that's what the, the policy makers decided to use for their sector. And then the third is uh, uh, for, of course, health information. Uh, if you have health data as part of India's national digital health mission, uh, the consent managers for health data are, are called health data consent managers, HDCMs. Right, and uh, 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 for, for telecom information, uh, the consent managers for telecom data uh, uh, will be the account aggregators itself. So telecom has decided to plug in the telcos as part of the existing financial sector framework uh, and not have to create a new set of consent managers and try to regulate them. So if you look at the flow, Right. What happened is the consent artifact that I showed you earlier was then adopted by all financial sector regulators and they created the institutional layer around it, put RBI in the driving seat saying you will license these entities and these are what are called as account aggregators. Uh, eight of them have received an approval from RBI, four have got their operational license so they are you know uh, uh, up and running. And on the left hand side you have where your data resides. So these are called financial information providers, right? So it could be a bank, mutual fund depository, insurer, or even a tax system or telcos for that matter, right? On the right-hand side, you have financial information users. This is where, you know, you want to share your data with so that you can avail of a service. It could be, you know, lenders giving you a cash flow loan. It could be a 
robo advisor giving you various forms of you know uh, personalized advice on what are the right financial products for you and so on now how would the data sharing transactions work so like i said traditionally it was broken because a user will either run around to different providers physically or digitally and then create that folder and send it to the financial information user you know even for something as simple as pre covid when i was applying for a visa uh, i actually had to go to my bank branch get 6 months print out stamped by them right and then take that to the consulate uh, why couldn't i you know you know one click manner seamlessly share that information just like you know one click manner i can authorize a payment transaction and so that's really what the account aggregators are facilitating uh, so a user can register with an account aggregator like i said uh, there are four and many more will further be licensed by rbi so i can register with any one uh, of my choice and they will compete on different front end experiences uh, and different segments of the population that they serve uh, once i register with an account aggregator i will then discover where all my data resides and then link my account so you know let's say my data resides with a bank or two banks sbi and icici then once it's discovered i will link so icici and sbi will send me an otp i'll have to provide that otp slash token and then the linkage gets authorized the account aggregator cannot store your data and the entire data flows end to end encrypted so once i've linked my account tomorrow i can show up at a lender and the lender says hey uh, in order to give you a loan uh, give me your account aggregator id and so i give him my account aggregator id he saying siddharth at the rate of aa1 and then in real time the lender now sends me a consent request So imagine I'll get a notification on my smartphone saying, "Hey, lender one's asking your data for this purpose for this time period. Uh, do you authorize consent or not for these accounts?" And then if I say yes, in real time the consent artifact that I showed you earlier gets generated by the account aggregator, sent to the respective financial information providers, who will internally fetch data from their internal systems and digitally sign that information. and encrypt it and return it back and that encrypted information will then be sent to the lender uh, in in near real time as well now india's largest financial institutions have adopted this framework so the rollout is happening within the financial sector within banking to start off with so you've got you know all the major banks sbi on the public sector side on the private sector side hdfc icici access um, in the same a uh, large nbfcs like the judge himself the uh, cmi finance and others uh, that are also early adopters of this system and this also includes of course uh, on the taxation side gst and as well which is a critical data set for small businesses uh and essentially uh, a user can then register with any a of their choice link these available accounts and seamlessly share this information for a range of use cases to start off with this is happening within a set of entities that are registered or regulated by one of the sectoral regulators rbi sebi csr iit or the ministry of finance and over a period of time it will be opened up to unregulated players as well uh, like i mentioned to you you know the us consulate example uh, or many other use cases you can think of i'll stop here uh, so generally people may have questions on the floor Uh, uh, and and take take a set of questions with them. Right, Vineet, uh, do you want to unmute yourself and ask the question, or I could read it for you? Uh, I can unmute. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Thanks, thanks Anna. Thanks, thanks for that. That that was quite uh, very well explained. Uh, I think uh, I had few questions. I think one of them was answered by you in. the subsequent uh description of the consent uh i had this question on this end to end encryption so uh who who does this encryption uh, like who owns the key in this particular case is it the the financial information providers on the left like individual banks will own it uh whose responsibility is it in this particular framework sure that's a good question so the the keys are fundamentally owned by the financial information user because they are the only ones that should be able to decrypt the information 
Uh, the end-to-end -end encryption model also includes an element of what's called perfect forward secrecy. So these are not long-term keys that are generated, which means you know one key being used for encryption across multiple transactions, but every single data sharing transaction has a new key that gets generated by the FIU. That key, then encrypted, is, and there's a protocol called the Diffie-Hellman key exchange that is used, right? And that's the key that's then used by the financial information provider when they receive it to encrypt the data and send it back to the FIU. Uh, this is a similar model. Uh, for example, if any of you use either WhatsApp or Signal or Messenger, uh, a lot of them will use the same end-to-end -end encryption protocol in that sense, because you know your message is brokered by their server, even in the case of Signal, but your message is end-to-end -end encrypted with perfect forward secrecy, only gets decrypted in your trusted client, which is you know your phone and my phone. And we are the only two entities that can read it. In this case, it would either be it would be the financial information user's environment where it gets decrypted, or the individual's mobile phone itself where it gets decrypted, right? Because in the trusted client of my mobile phone, I can fetch my own data, right? I may not want to share it with a lender. I may just want to see my a PDF of my bank transactions. Uh, and of course, other activity and then visualized to me. And I can receive that in the trusted client of my account. Uh, so, uh, does that mean, uh, if I'm able to correctly understand or visualize it, uh, does that mean that this, this entire key management system is basically owned, uh, is basically provided by the architecture, like there is yeah, there uh, is a detailed there is a detailed specification okay. that's been laid out, and you know yeah, how okay. to share that. Uh, that's a standard. So in fact, these technical standards have been notified uh, by RBI on behalf of all these sectoral regulators, and uh, there is a detailed end-to-end uh, -end encryption document. Uh, uh, and I'm you know happy to I'll send that across to uh, uh, Sahana, and I'm happy if she can share that, uh, or if you just send me an email, it might also make it easier. I'm SID at ISPIRT.IN, and I'm happy to send that across to you. Sure, sure, sure. Uh, and then I had one question on when you showed the the consent, the info, uh, the example consent, uh, the digital consent. You mentioned that the data access is uh, there's a uh, there's read, uh, store, or, or query. This, these are the three options. So my question is, how is this enforced? Like, uh, if I say that my data is only for reading, and uh, uh, and I, I give that particular consent, uh, does that mean uh, that an app? Or how will an app perform in that case? Uh, can that application not read and store on its own? Uh, sorry, Vineet, my Zoom crashed. Uh, could you please repeat your question? Yeah. So the the uh, the one slide where you showed the consent uh, artifact, right? Uh, there was one detail about that the data access, the permission on the data is about reading, uh, storing, or querying. Yeah. Uh, so my question is, how is this enforced? So if I'm the user and I have given the permission that you know you can only read. Uh, or probably, you know, you can only read a particular part. So, so let's say, uh, uh, when, when I'm, I'm just trying to understand like the granularity of this. So, if I'm if I'm saying that I have given uh, a permission to read uh, this particular part of the data, yeah, then how is this enforced? Like the end application who is going to access this uh, based on this consent. Uh, how 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 does uh, how does that uh, ensure that person after reading storing the data on their own system? Sure. So there are uh, you know three types of data access uh, like you rightly identified. The first is sharing of raw transactional data with a data consumer. Mm -hmm. That involves you know all your transaction details going to them. They running the computation in their environment. Phase two is you not sharing all of this raw transactional data, but you only sharing a query, right? Which is a particular subset or, 
you know, a pre-computed query uh, on top of this transactional data and only the response of that query is shared with the data consumer. That's more privacy preserving. Like I said, instead of sharing my 10th mark sheet, I only share whether I've passed my 10th or not. The third is what we essentially call, and that will happen in phase three, uh, where, you know, instead of data moving to the code and then being computed on in an external environment, can the code, can the models be brought to the data? And that's where the notion of a virtual data room gets, comes in, right? Because in a virtual data room, think of it like an M&A transaction. And what happens is, you know, all the data, all the paperwork is in a single room. Everyone enters with no devices, nothing. You compute, you make your decision in that room, you walk out with taking no additional data from them, right? So similarly, uh, there is uh, a bunch of work that's happening around in the third phase, what would the design of such a virtual data room look like? Where you know you bring in your data in a privacy preserving environment, you bring in your code and models, and you only take the output or the insights from that computation out. Uh, so that's the third phase within which it will happen. That's first getting tested out for establishing access to non-personal data, you know, the anonymized data sets, and then it would be applied to uh, 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 personal data going forward. But you know, that's probably at least uh, three to five years out from where we currently are. Oh, got it, got it, got it. Thanks, Vinit. Uh, um, yeah. So that so we'll do the demo. We do have a bunch a couple more questions, but given okay. that we have ten minutes, let's run the demo and then come back. Okay. So I'll show you two demos to you know answer uh, one question that came in on uh, you know, of course one is to bring this to life. And second is I'll pull up another demo on, you know, an accessible flow that was built out uh, uh, for uh, consent managers. So this demo in the interest of time is only going to be the account aggregator component of a larger lending app, right? So what's happening here is not an individual, but an MSME wants to avail of finance. The MSME says, hey, I want to avail a loan against my invoice. You know, invoice is getting paid 120 days from now. I want a loan today, right? And uh, therefore, I need to share my GST information and my bank account information in an uh, informed consent and manner with the, a network of lenders. So this is the first time flow. So the user, as you see, is going to, sorry. What you'll see out here is the user will register with an account aggregator. So this is part of a larger lending application uh, that's been built out. Uh, so the user registers with an account aggregator of their choice. FinView is one of them that has a license from RBI. He will then, you know, this is his informed consent, but the first step is really for him to discover and link his accounts. So he's now going to discover his bank accounts. So he's adding a bank account. This is the linkage between the AA and the FIP. So he's linking his SBI current account. And he's now going to link his GSTN account. Now that he's linked his two accounts, he authorizes uh, consent. And as you can see, it lays out what data was is being shared for what purpose uh, and what time period. And that's being shared with the lenders in real time who have less than 10 seconds to return back with a loan offer. So these are a range of loan offers that he has now received against every I will now try to pull up a demo, maybe give me a few seconds. I'm going to pull up a demo of how uh, a different version of this consent manager would look like for people that have various accessibility constraints. So let me just pull that up.
So that's why you do that. I'll just give you two questions to just respond in a bit. Or would you need concentration to find this? Press. Okay, I'm, I'm guessing you said go ahead. Okay, so there's a question on um, whether accountability and grievance redressal mechanisms is encoded in the architecture. Um, and given the demo, there's a follow-up question on any concerns of consent fatigue, any thinking about the capacities for informed consent? Yeah. So if you look at it, uh, you know, you can imagine informed the consent request being uh, uh, enabled with uh, various, uh, for example, data trust scores going forward, right? So one way to abstract out the complexity of the consent request is saying, you know, if you look at the world of consumer appliances, uh, if you wanted to change consumers' decisions around buying more energy efficient devices, you wouldn't have consumers sit and calculate, you know, the, the energy consumption of a fridge, but instead, you know, by putting out on a five star basis, is this appliance, you know, three stars, four stars or five stars, right? And that really abstracted around a lot of the complexity and allowed uh, consumers to then take an informed call uh, before they made a purchase decision, right? And so you can imagine a similar set of data trust scores being built, right? Where before I share my data, I'm informed that, okay, this particular FIU is, you know, maybe rated three out of five, or, you know, it's an A, B, C, so it's an A grade, right? And if he's an A grade, I'm happy to share it with him. If he's a C grade, my consent manager will, you know, automatically block me from even sharing it with him, right? Uh, in the browser world today, if a website doesn't have an SSL certificate uh, where the communication is over a, a, a two-way SSL uh, encrypted line, uh, you know, your browser notifies, gives you a warning. And you can imagine consent managers giving you similar such warnings going forward as well. And that builds in even more accountability on the FIU's end where they say, you know, if I have a low score because of either poor compliance with the previous consent artifacts, data breaches, and so on, consumers are not going to share their information with me. And therefore, I have to make uh, the best possible efforts and you know, get myself certified and move further up. Uh, so those are some of the other ways. You know, one, the consent decision can be simplified for consumers, and you can influence uh, uh, the right behavior of data consumers uh, 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 as well. On the notion of over consenting, I think that would love to get, you know, anyone that's interested on in contributing towards this problem, would love to hear from you towards the end of this call, uh, or even after this call. Uh, I, I definitely think uh, that continues to be a valid concern uh, for you. Yeah, Sahana, you mentioned, you know, dogs are okay and like construction yes. work is okay. I think. No, no, we didn't say it. Okay, but yeah, okay. <laughs> I have check marks all, all of this. Uh, but uh, yeah, so if you look at it uh, from an over consenting standpoint, I, I think that remains a genuine concern. Uh, we do expect the government to run public educational campaigns as well, and it's going to take time, right? And therefore, there are that's the reason why it's starting off in a constrained manner with registered or regulated entities. Sorry, that's why it's starting off in a constrained manner with registered or regulated entities so that, you know, under the guise of RBI and others, uh, adequate, uh, not just protections are being built in, but also there's redressal mechanisms uh, and these entities are, you know, can be held accountable later uh, in the case of any privacy harms that may take place. Uh, but as this opens up to a larger market, right, and uh, uh, various other players come in, uh, uh, over consenting does remain a, a genuine concern till such time consumers themselves are educated and aware about uh, about these new kinds of experiences. Okay, um, thanks for that. So do you want to do the second demo now? Or? Yeah, this. Uh, so I was talking. So actually, I uh, wasn't able to search for it. Just give me a minute. I will uh, pull it up. No problem.
if um, if it's okay, we could because we just have like three minutes. We could take the rest of the questions, and if you could share the link with them, that is also fine. Whichever works. Yeah, I found the link. So if you, I'm sending the link to uh, okay, on the chat. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So if you click on the link I've sent you, uh, that shows an implementation of a consent manager. Uh, for people that you know either don't know English and therefore need a multilingual experience, uh, individuals that you know uh, are blind and therefore how do they authorize consent uh, using an audio driven experience, right? And so on. So I'd, I'd strongly urge you guys to take a look at that. And that's just another example of an implementation that's been built up. Great. Um, and we have a bunch of questions on the consent manager. So if there is a, a file or a document that can give people more insight, that would also be great. But if you could, um, overall the questions are, you know, uh, sorry. I'll, I'll, there is, and Niti Ayog has recently published, uh, you know, a detailed document on this data empowerment and protection architecture. I am also going to send you uh, this link uh, for everyone. It, it covers, you know, in detail, uh, the policy, the technology and the institutional elements uh, uh, as well. So if anyone's interested in going deeper, uh, I think this one document would, would give you that over. Amazing. And about the aggregators and how they are regulated. I'm assuming that's exactly. correct. Yeah, okay. that's correct. Great. So we're going to take one question and that was around how can Rajini actually provide consent? Uh, actual consent other than through aggregators or through consent providers? Is there, is there something would you like to address that? So, yeah, so if you look at it from a luxury standpoint, right, uh, fundamentally... You, somebody's at a vengeance around you. <laughs> So going back to Rajni, right? What we fundamentally said is that Rajni would be availing of finance uh, or you know uh, whichever of the other use cases, portability of skilling information, uh, or portability of health records on the back of her smartphone, right? So you can imagine Rajni downloading a consent manager on a smartphone. It's a multilingual consent manager. Uh, if you look at the link I sent, you know it would be symbol driven rather than text driven for that matter, right? And so uh, on the back of that, she will have the ability to, in an informed manner, authorize that consent. Now that I'm sharing with you is a self-service version of a consent manager for Rajni. Similarly, for other individuals that may not be familiar, let's say she has a feature phone, right? And then how do I authorize sharing? And you know, 700 million, 800 million have feature phones. Then there is an assisted experience that's possible. So you can imagine going to say customer service centers and so on, right? where in an assisted manner, they'll help you discover your accounts, link your accounts. Uh, this is what's happening in the world, in healthcare today uh, for health information, right? And then authorize consent on an assisted device. Imagine, you know, telemedicine in a rural area, you know, the truck shows up, the van shows up, which has all the right telemedicine equipment, uh, the operators in the van, but you know, the doctor sitting in Mumbai, a city far away. Uh, how do you authorize sharing of your health records with that doctor? And you know, you don't have a smartphone. So the operator in that van can use a consent manager in an assisted model uh, that allows you to discover your health records, link it, uh, and then subsequently authorize sharing of your health records with that doctor. Uh, and these consent managers are regulated, like I said, in the financial space, they're regulated by RBI, in the health space, they'll be regulated by MHA and so on, uh, so that they have you know, built the right set of informed consent experiences for the user, you know, they don't maliciously show the wrong things to the user. Great, I think we are about time now. Um, and these documents that you shared, I'll share that as a, uh, along with my, you know, the note that I sent out post the session. So thanks very much, Sid, for giving us this insider view of uh, DEPA. Hope you, our participants, were able to. Um, found this relevant, we're able to find answers to some of your questions and also possibilities for your own missions. We appreciate you spending your evening with us. We'll stay connected. I'll share these links to these documents via email as well as Sid's email ID. And um, yeah, thanks so much for joining us today. Take care.
Thank you so much. Thank you, Sana, for inviting me. Thanks, Thank sir. you, sir. Thanks so much for your time. Take care, everyone. Thank mm -hmm. you.